Okay, so we're going to jump in with some introductions, and then we'll get started with uh, what is a panel session here. I'll uh, start off. My name is Josh Barron. I'm the Senior Academic Technology Officer at Marist College. I'm also serving on the Aperio Board. If you're not familiar with Aperio, it's an open source uh, nonprofit foundation that resulted from the merger of the Sakai and JSIC Foundation about two years ago. I'll let my colleagues introduce them themselves. Hi there, I'm Norman Beard, yeah, director of the Open Learning Initiative at Carnegie Mellon. And uh, sort of standing up here and looking at the three of us, um, notice that we've got three white guys representing uh, Open Learning Analytics. So this actually isn't the face of learning analytics research. We're, we usually are a much more diverse crowd. Dean Hoklev, I'm a PhD student in computer-supported collaborative learning at the University of Toronto, and I also work as an institutional researcher with the Open U Toronto project. Okay, so I think uh, collectively what we are hoping to achieve here in this session is to really kind of stimulate a discussion around the importance of uh, learning analytics uh, and particularly open learning analytics in the larger open ed uh, movement and field. Uh, I think many of us working in the area of learning analytics, which I'll define a little bit uh, for you in a moment, have seen huge potential in the next uh, five to ten years for it to really transform in fundamental ways uh, education and particularly open education in terms of OER content, instructional methods, and so forth. Uh, but a lot of the work that's been done to date has been done in a fairly closed and prioritary kind of way. And I think there's a real risk that this could limit the ability for open uh, education materials to take advantage of learning analytics in the future. At least that would be what we might postulate, it might be something we talked about here uh, in a few minutes. Longer term, we're really hoping that we can start to connect up the open ed network of practice with the learning analytics and the open learning analytics uh, networks as well. I think there's going to be a lot of uh, common activity between the two groups that can result in some real uh, innovation. So what we're going to try to do here in the relatively short time we have is I'm going to start by setting some context very, very briefly. Each of us will then uh, very briefly go through some examples of work that's happening in the open learning analytics space, or in some cases barriers to that work uh, because things aren't as open as we'd like. And we were hoping to have about 10 minutes here at the end for discussion and Q&A. Since we go through this very, very quickly, we have a lot of resources on our slides at the end. We'll publish the slides out and go into more detail on these things uh, on your own. Just to make sure we're on the same page, there's a lot of buzzwords and hype around analytics and hiring right now. And I think some terminology confusion. So just to help us a little bit here, I thought I'd mention that there's, in my mind, two broad buckets that analytics and higher ed falls into. We have academic analytics, which tends to be more about using predictive analytics to improve the business of education. What we're more focused on is learning analytics, using predictive analytics to help learners improve the teaching and learning uh, process uh, more directly. Uh, I think a lot of people credit uh, George Siemens and the Solar Organization Society for Learning Analytics and Research for kind of kicking off the discussion around openness in the learning analytics field back in 2011 with a white paper you may have seen that they published. They really uh, kind of made a call for action around the need for open frameworks and open platforms for uh, learning analytics. More recently, uh, George, myself, and Kim Arnold from the University of Wisconsin organized an international open learning analytics summit uh, this past March. It followed the Learning Analytics and Knowledge Conference. It brought together about 40 kind of international experts in the learning analytics field who also had a great passion for openness to talk about uh, what are these areas or kind of what we started to call knowledge domains that fall under the open learning analytics umbrella as means to help organize ourselves uh, for, for some uh, future work. And those are just few of the organizations that are involved. There are many, many different institutions involved uh, as well. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through these five uh, knowledge domains that emerged from that summit. Um, but the basic idea is uh, now what we're uh, starting to engage around is using these domains to identify who around the world are working on these things, where are there gaps in these domains, meaning things that we think we should be doing that isn't really happening yet, and then obviously work to try to connect up people working in these domains globally to help prevent kind of reinventing the wheel phenomenon. I'll point to the last domain there, because that might be where the greatest intersection is between folks in this community and the open learning analytics uh, community. So there's a lot of interest around applying predictive analytics to do things like improving content, OER, um, improving instruction, and so forth. And that would be maybe one place where we could uh, come together. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. 
So, like so many conversations and no many, so many beginnings uh, in the open ed space, my exposure to open learning analytics began with a conversation with David Wiley and Table Green. Um, and uh, what they brought to my attention, I think, has uh, ended up bubbling up as a theme throughout a few talks. This is the third talk at Open Ed that I've been doing that relates to data and analytics. And there's been this common theme of the relationship between openness and science. I'll talk about that a bit over the next few slides. But what I'd like to work through here is the need for transparency in this space if we accept the underlying assumption that learning analytics offer us an opportunity to bring to the surface some things that are valuable and that are normally hidden from us uh, about student outcome achievement, about student progression, and about student engagement. And that is an assumption I'm making, that we can say something useful there and that it is valuable for us to, to be able to say those things. Uh, from there, I'll highlight a couple of specific challenges and talk about some interesting opportunities. So that conversation with David and Table really pointed out, uh, from their perspective, this notion that in as much as we are being successful in the open education community and developing and promoting a greater number of more effective resources, we're also commoditizing that content. And then the content by itself um, is going to become less and less valuable as content, particularly given that it offers us this opportunity to capture information about how our learners are interacting with and making use of that content. And so as we look ahead to the future, we're expecting that there's going to be a greater demand both for well-instrumented content and the tools that can go in and analyze how students are engaging with those materials. Um, and I think this has actually been reflected recently in some blog posts from uh, Michael Feldstein, who was talking about how the publishing world seems to be perceiving uh, the open education space and open educational resources. In some ways, then, this connection to learning analytics is the same connection that we see for driving some of our original goals in the open ed world. But it also ties in very nicely with some of the goals of the open source software world. And this is, in some ways, the idea that by making software transparent, we are not only exposing potential bugs and defects, but we're also expanding the community that's able to interact with those things and improve them. Currently, much of the space around learning analytics has been dominated by closed systems and proprietary systems. What this means is that people are simply asking you to trust what's happening under the hood. And this is dangerous, right? And, and I think this is dangerous whether it's the Open Learning Initiative, uh, you know, whether I'm pointing at my dashboard and telling you, no, 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 you can trust me. The underlying cognitive model here is good. Um, or you know, whether it's Newton who's saying, yeah, I think that uh, you know, this stuff is pretty powerful and I can tell you something valuable about student learning. If we're not able to expose the underlying assumptions and the underlying models that are driving those predictions, we're no longer doing science. We're doing alchemy. And um, I'm not interested in being an alchemy. Some of the examples of the work that we're facing and uh, real, real challenges in the open analytics space frequently at this point are revolving around the sharing of data and uh, quickly looking at some work that we've been doing in the uh, community college space where capturing data and coming up with the agreements necessary to plug those in either to simple analytic systems or even to do research has been a real challenge. And this was also further highlighted with uh, some recent partnerships we did around Coursera MOOCs that our current regulatory inheritance around student data has a very specific sense of risk that may or may not be accurate and uh, has some real constraints around how we're able to engage with and interact with that data. And I think driving forward along in the uh, open analytics space is going to require uh, at least some more thoughtful approaches. In terms of some opportunities, there are a number of initiatives that are attempting to open up what's happening under the hood. I talked earlier this session about uh, the Simon Data Lab, and we're working currently with the Open University around this idea of design analytics. And these are things we're hoping to get out into the world. We're also seeing some better work around open platforms that will allow both the use and the development of new models, something that uh, is happening at Stanford in a nice way, something that Josh will be able to talk about. So I want to give you a little bit of a view from the trenches. When you're in the midst of this data, and how does that look like for someone from the outside? Now, there's a bunch of different perspectives and roles to look at learning analytics, and that's one of the interesting things with the Learning Analytics Conference, is that you come there thinking that analytics is one thing, and I have a very researcher-centric kind of post hoc, the course is finished, here's all my data, now I need to do my analysis, write my paper, and publish it. And, you, and then you meet people who are doing you know, very fancy data warehousing where they're real-time integrating a lot of different data sources and doing real-time prediction. You have instructors who are getting a specific feedback for their course and are doing real-time um, adjustment of their teaching. So you get all these different people meeting. But 
if you look at uh, researchers, I mean, there's a lot of different challenges now with these really big data uh, amounts. At the University of Toronto, um, we have some MOOCs on Coursera and edX, and we were lucky enough to get three uh, MOOC research initiative grants about a year ago. And so even though we've been looking at the data earlier, this was when we kind of really did a headfirst dive into the data and started to realize how much work it would be to actually get something meaningful out of it. The first is, is just the amount of data and how different it is. So we're talking gigabytes and gigabytes in a bunch of different formats. And for a distributed team that needs to collaborate on this data in a reproducible, secure way that's respecting student risks that enable us to say when we come to the final paper, this actually goes all the way back to the raw data in a way that we can trace and debug. It required us to really look at what kind of tools are available for, for doing that. So for example, there's all kinds of databases. Part of the problem is well, as well working with these uh, platforms that, uh, for example, Coursera is not open source, is that you're relying on their descriptions of the data, which not, might not be up to date, which might not be complete. And if you see a data field that you don't recognize, you kind of have to guess where it came from, uh, which is problematic for a researcher. But the, the real challenge for us was uh, the click logs, which is you know the big data, which everyone is very excited about. This is literally how it looks. It's about 20 million lines of that for one course. Okay, Every single chunk, so four or five lines, which actually is one long line, is one click or one movement of the mouse. And by the way, those fields are not documented anywhere. And throughout the file, suddenly there would be a field called 13 colon that I still don't know to this day what means. So I ignored that. So we had to come up with processes to say, turn this into some kind of a structured format. Now we have every single click. OK. Now we have every single click for one student grouped into chunks of all these clicks were actually one time watching a video, but he was just going back and forth. And then we want to go to a higher level of abstraction and say each line is one watching the video, but we're using all that data to say, is it the first time you watched the video? Did he scroll around a lot? And then we can take that data and do different kinds of learning analytics to look at are there certain subsequences that are more common for certain students. This is when we're finally getting into the interesting research and analytics part where there's theory, where there's borrowing from a lot of different domains that have been dealing with big data. This was the last week of our four-month project where we got to this level. Three or four months was spent dealing with all those other stages. And by the way, 30 other projects were doing exactly the same thing, reinventing the wheel over and over again, right? By the way, the code that we made, some of it's open source, but by now the formats have changed. So it might not, you might actually not be able to use our tools. So there's a, a really urgent need for more standardized data formats and for better sharing of those processing tools um, so that we as a community can be much more efficient at asking the difficult questions rather than spending our time formatting data, right? There's the, the ethics piece, which is also maybe we would like to share our data with others, but that's certainly not possible today. What does it mean to anonymize data reliably? That's, that's still a, actually a research question that's very uh, current and something that we probably don't know enough about as educational researchers. And I just want to briefly mention, I could talk for two hours about uh, reproducible research, but I want to put it out there because I think it, it's really important. It's something we as a community should try to move towards. Uh, so this is a paper that I read, um, I think from the Oxford uh, Internet Institute, where they did some social network analysis on MOOCs. And they, and they generated these interesting graphs week by week of how the students were communicating with each other. And I thought, that's really interesting because I did something similar, but I never got uh, far enough to publish. Reading through, I was wondering how did they get these graphs? Because knowing from my own experience, there's so many ways that you can tweak these parameters that might give you very different results. So in this case, I sent it the, the person who wrote the paper an email and I said, could I look at your code? And one in a hundred, he actually agreed, which is fairly rare. So he sent me all his Python. Um, and whenever I have time, I will try to implement that on our data. It would be quite interesting. But the ideal would actually be that if I'm, so this is a great example from a platform called Authoria. The idea would be that if I'm reading a, a paper that has a graph, I should be able to, and this is, if I click on this graph, it will open it in an IPython notebook. So this is a virtual computing environment that, where I have access to all of their raw data and the calculations that created that graph. So I can go in and look at the graph that they made. I can quickly change some parameters, and that's one line above, and I can see how that graph changes. Right? So I can go in right away, click on any graph, and I can start exploring their data. And I think that's the kind of thing that we want to be moving towards as a community. There are lots of challenges. There are technical challenges. There are ethical challenges. There's researchers competing. But that's the kind of thing that we need to work on.
Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm going to go pretty lightning fast through here. Um, I'm going to give you a quick snapshot of the Open Academic Analytics Initiative. I should mention that this project started before the term learning analytics became well established, so it probably should have been the Open Learning Analytics Initiative. This was a EDUCAUSE NGLC program, uh, similar to the Kaleidoscope project that Kim mentioned earlier, funded through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation primarily. And the goal was kind of twofold. One was to develop an open source academic early alert system that would allow us to identify which students in a specific course were at risk to not complete that course, do that prediction very early on in the first two to three weeks, um, and then obviously roll out interventions to help those students be successful. We were also researching what we called scaling factors in learning analytics, so looking at things like the portability of predictive models. We build a predictive model based on data from one type of institution, how accurate and effective will it be at a different type of institution, and we were also researching how effective uh, different intervention strategies were. Give you a very high level overview of how we kind of approach this kind of work. Uh, the first thing is to develop a predictive model based on historical data. In this case, we're working with student demographic and aptitude data, things like SAT scores, gender, and so forth, uh, coming from student information systems, as well as uh, learning management system data, in this case coming from Sakai. So we're using event log data, looking at what students are clicking on, content they're reading, discussions they're participating in, as well as gradebook data. So we took three semesters of data from every student at Marath College, brought this together into a single repository, and used somewhat sophisticated data mining uh, techniques to develop a predictive model. As far as I know, we're the first group to release a predictive model of this nature under an open license. I don't know if Cable is here in this room, but there was, we had to figure out what kind of license to use because it wasn't totally clear. Uh, and, the, and at the end, I'll, I'll show you where you can go download that. Um, then in kind of our courses are going on in kind of near real time, this kind of data flows into the predictive model scoring process. Uh, takes place to identify the students who are at risk. That gets put onto an academic alert report sent to the instructor, who then ultimately deploys one of uh, two different kind of intervention strategies uh, to help the students succeed. Um, a little quick here on the research design we have. We rolled this out to 2,200 students at two community colleges and two historically black college universities. Uh, we, most cases, had uh, one instructor teaching three sections of the same course. One section has acted as a control group, which received no interventions, and the other two sections received one of the two interventions that we were uh, researching. Um, real quick snapshot of some of our findings. We are pleasantly surprised, but certainly surprised to find statistically significant impact on final course grades, which in a very kind of early prototype kind of process, we weren't quite expecting that kind of finding, which leads us to believe that as this technology matures, and as we, for example, hopefully create a library of open models that people are contributing to and improving the performance on, we can get even better uh, results. Uh, we also were looking at something called content mastery, which uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, defines as getting a C grade or higher. And there, too, we found students who received interventions uh, uh, were more likely to master the content than those in our control groups. I've skipped over about two years of, of three researchers' lives and a tremendous amount of other findings and information. Uh, so if you're interested, we published a 40-page uh, detailed research uh, paper in the Journal of Learning Analytics, which is an open access journal, so you can go there and uh, take a look at it. We'll be putting these slides out so you can uh, easily get access to that. Uh, last slide here is just kind of a glimpse of what we've uh, been doing now since that grant ended. So through the Aperio uh, Learning Analytics Initiative, which is a partnership between Marist College, University of Amsterdam, Sinclair Community College, and Unicom, which is a commercial affiliate in the Aperio community, we are uh, working on now building out, I think will be the world's first complete open platform for learning analytics. And it has these kind of five major components to them, a collections component, so we're using some of the emerging standards and APIs to bring data in from almost any source you might want to collect learning data from uh, into a uh, storage area, that's the second component, uh, which we're using the learning record store standards for that. Uh, there's an analysis component, this is kind of the brains of the, the system where all the uh, complex analytics, uh, predictive analytics happens, data mining, predictive model generation, and so forth. And the results from the analysis then get pushed out to two different uh, possible uh, components. 
One is a communications uh, component that could be dashboards and so forth, and then also pushing out results to other systems that might want to then use that information to, let's say, have another intervention, have an advisor reach out to the student, uh, and so forth. So at this point, um, Amsterdam has completed initial work on the collections and, and storage component. In a minute, I'll show you where you can get access to that. Uh, Marist College and Unicon have just recently released what we're calling the Learning Analytic Processor, which is that analysis component. This is an early first release, but it's now there uh, as code for people to access. And there's another project that just actually got released within the week called the Open Dashboard Project, which is an open source dashboard uh, framework um, that would be that middle component. And we're now working with Sinclair Community College to connect the learning analytics processor to something called the Student Success Plan, which is kind of a case-based uh, advising tool so that alerts uh, on student performance from the predictive model will trigger an advisor to reach out to the student and meet with them. Um, again, skipping over many months of people's lives, but I apologize for getting quickly. Uh, if you're interested, again, these slides will be available. You can go to uh, these two uh, Aperio uh, wiki pages where you can get a lot more details and documentation and also links to GitHub where all of that work I just mentioned is available uh, under an open license. I will end by, by selfish plug for the Learning Analytics and Knowledge Conference. Uh, which is being hosted at Marist College this year in March. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, maybe I'll see you there, and hopefully the weather will be slightly warmer. So there are the links, and again, we'll promise to get all these slides out. Uh, and with that, I think we're going to uh, take some questions for discussion. I'm noticing I forgot to remove my insert more questions there, but maybe we'll just get more questions. I guess I would say that it's less any specific law and more this general sense of our regulatory inheritance, right? It's, it's this notion of FERPA either as it exists or as it uh, is perceived. You know, this notion of what FERPA really is versus how people imagine it to be. Combined with our practice of protecting subjects for research and the way that IRBs normally behave. And when you start to put those pieces together, we end up with a place where it's very challenging to share data. Um, this is compounded by the fact that higher education in the US is not particularly good at collaborating with one another. Uh, it's, we've, it's, it's just not what we've done well at in the past. I've been very happy with the uh, recommendations coming out of the Asilomar Convention. It's a meeting that happened earlier this summer. If you Google Asilomar Convention, or it's a link on it is in the slide deck, there's a nice set of recommendations for how we might start thinking about the role that data has in learning research and how we can balance out appropriate attention to risk to the learner with the uh, benefits that might play out. So it's, uh, smarter people than I drafted that document. I'll just quickly add that um, I've been relatively impressed with uh, messaging coming out of the White House recently around open data, particularly around FERPA and the need to address these issues. So hopefully that will result. And I'll just add from an international perspective, um, because obviously every jurisdiction has different laws, but it's also an institutional, um, I think, capacity building problem for the ethics committees at different universities. Uh, and there's already been some work in the learning sciences community, for example, to come up with uh, the problem is that you typically don't have the technical competence uh, among the people there to justify whether, you know, is this uh, store that's stored in a, in a cloud, is that secure enough? Is, you know, the anonymization process, is that actually not reversible? And so if we could come up as a community with some recommendations and best practices that we could then, you know, attach to our ethics proposal and say, we are going to follow all of these. They've been vetted, they've been used in other instances, then our ethics um, committee would feel much more confident um, going forwards as well. So I think we have to work at uh, multiple levels. So we, uh, I think we promised a Twitter back channel and at least the first tweet that I saw it was a fairly common sentiment that I've heard at a few of these presentations. The, uh, the tweets, the, something to the effect of the dream of learning analytics is to accomplish something that can already be done simply by talking to students. Um, so I mean, I, there's obviously an awful lot that can be gained by talking to students, but I think that if you look at the current state of student success, um, it's, it's clear that it's not being accomplished. And in as much as we're able to build tools that can help support those conversations and scale up the amount of work that educators can do in that space, um, we're remiss in being dismissive of uh, how these tools can support us. So absent the ability to put thousands of more educators into our institutions to have those conversations, I'd, I'd like to keep building out the technology to help you do your job.
So I see folks needing to come in for lunch. So maybe what we'll do is uh, be happy to uh, take more questions here or maybe even eat lunch with folks at the table here that have more questions. So thanks a lot.